para discutir um tema que não só é relevante em si, mas um tema que tem ah, avolumado a sua importância, até porque as ruas vêm reivindicando ah, uma discussão mais consistente, mais séria sobre a questão da corrupção. E não somente no Brasil, mas em muitas outras paradas. Tá? Então, nesse sentido, é um privilégio não só receber hoje aqui ah, o professor Kevin Davis, que além de uma autoridade nesse tema que vem discutindo essa questão há muito tempo, também é um especialista na área de direito e desenvolvimento e, portanto, cruza essas duas discussões, a discussão sobre desenvolvimento com a discussão sobre corrupção, o que, de fato, é altamente relevante, porque houve um momento na história onde esses assuntos corriam de maneira dissociada, com grandes prejuízos para a questão de corrupção. Uh, uh, ao redor do mundo. Né? O professor Kevin é professor <risos> da Universidade de Nova York. Além disso, ele é hoje o vice-diretor para a questão de relações internacionais da, dessa escola de direito. Tem sido um colaborador muito próximo dessa escola. Há alguns anos, o professor Kevin foi convidado ainda Uh, na gestão do meu querido uh, colega, professor Ari Oswaldo Matos Filho, para fazer uma consultoria para essa escola, uma avaliação. Uh, o relatório dele é um modelo de concisão, de precisão e de generosidade, porque não só ele era um relatório uh, que apontava diversos pontos a serem uh, melhorados dentro da escola, mas onde ele oferecia com grande uh, gentileza e educação algumas pistas uh, de caminhos que a escola poderia traçar. Né? E isso feito, uh, eu sinto que ele não, pode, não esteja entendendo, mas depois eu traduzirei para ele, uh, com uma enorme elegância, uh, porque não era a visão de alguém que venha de uma escola de muito prestígio, de um país que tem uma enorme tradição no ensino do direito, e que, portanto, estava dizendo como deveriam ser feitas as coisas. Ah, no mais das vezes, ele ressaltava pontos importantes dessa escola e nos alertava que nós estávamos tomando caminhos que, às vezes, eram desnecessários. Eu lembro de uma passagem específica do relatório, onde ele perguntava, mas por que, que vocês querem publicar tanto em revistas, em law reviews americanas, que não serão lidas no Brasil, que não terão impacto no Brasil? Talvez vocês devam a concentrar suas energias em resolver diversos dos problemas que se colocam. Então, é com essa a, a pessoa a, que tem uma sensibilidade enorme para os assuntos que nos afetam, que vocês hoje terão o privilégio de dialogar. Bom, além de, de fazer essa breve apresentação do, do nosso amigo Kevin Davis, eu gostaria de agradecer imensamente a uma pessoa que tem sido chave Uh, no projeto dessa escola, uh, de uh, tomar uma posição cada vez mais radicalmente orientada à pesquisa, uma pesquisa que busque extrair da realidade os elementos que fomentem, então, uma produção acadêmica consistente, que é a Maíra Machado. A Maíra, uh, ela, em alguma medida, reconstrói o campo do direito uh, penal, né, se aproximando da sociologia, se aproximando do direito administrativo, como a gente vai ver nessa pesquisa, e tendo uma abertura muito grande para um diálogo ah, interdisciplinar. Ela vem liderando dentro dessa escola esse projeto, que é um projeto que envolve não só a Direito GV, a Universidade de Nova York, mas também ah, os nossos colegas, e aí aproveito para agradecer a presença Uh, do Guilherme Jorge, que é professor da Universidade de Santo Andrés, também uma escola parceira da, da, da Direito GV, uh, nessa uh, grande pesquisa sobre corrupção e que, em alguma medida, busca compreender de que modo os diversos mecanismos que foram criados ao longo dessas duas últimas décadas têm respondido. Né? E, evidentemente, que uh, na minha rápida conversa com o Guilherme, Há sempre pontos muito negativos nesse processo, mas também existem mecanismos que têm dado respostas. Eu acho que todos nós que vivemos no Brasil nesses últimos anos temos nos deparado e, eventualmente, até nos surpreendido, muitas vezes, com a evolução ah, nesse campo. Né? 
Eu queria, além do mais, além de agradecer imensamente ao Guilherme, que já esteve aqui na escola ah, em outros momentos e que também tem sido um companheiro nessas ah, pesquisas, de agradecer ao Carlos Aires, que é professor ah, do nosso pós-Lato Senso, do GVLO, ah, que é uma pessoa que tem se preocupado com compliance, ou seja, de que modo dentro das empresas os cuidados são tomados para que elas não incorram em práticas de corrupção. E, enfim, agradecer a todos vocês que hoje vieram aqui para esse debate, que certamente é um, de, um debate que até pelo momento em que ele se coloca, seja o um momento social, seja o um momento legislativo, onde nós temos uma nova legislação ah, nesse campo, ah, que ah, eu queria agradecer e esperar que todos vocês ah, tenham o maior proveito desse debate. Então, sem uh, devolver a Maíra, ela me pediu, é ela que vai coordenar todos os trabalhos. Eu gostaria de convidar o nosso colega Kevin Davis para fazer uso da palavra. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Oscar, for what I presume were kind words. Um, so apologies for the fact that I have to do this in English, but uh, my Portuguese is not yet at the point, well, it's nowhere, so um, uh, this is the best I can do for now. Uh, so it's really wonderful to be back here at FGV. I always enjoy my visits here, and I think the timing of this particular visit was quite auspicious because Uh, as you heard, I do a lot of research on anti-corruption law, and in including the U.S. anti-corruption law, which is probably the best known component of it, that is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, I think, has been a bit of a model for international efforts to regulate corruption. I think it's been the origin of what I call the new paradigm, the new global paradigm for regulation of foreign corrupt practices. And I see that paradigm being embodied in legislation that you see in the UK, in what the World Bank does, in what Germany does, and now in what's embodied in the new Brazilian anti-corruption law. And so I have questions about that paradigm, and I think I'm in, it, this is a good time to, for you um, to think about uh, the merits of this new paradigm that Brazil has basically embraced with the new anti-corruption law. Before I start, let me just ask, um, how many of you are familiar with this area in general? So for instance, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, okay. And how many of you are dealing with this in, a, in the context of practice? Are you practicing lawyers? Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll I won't spend too much time explaining what it does, but I will say a lot about how it's been enforced uh, and uh, in, in, in practice, and because I think the concerns that I want to discuss come out of really the practice as it's evolved in the United States and, and elsewhere. So the basics. Uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act makes it an offense to pay bribes to foreign public officials, right? So that's the, the, the key. What I want to focus on is not so much that, but the key elements of the way in which it's been uh, applied. Right? The, the elements of what I call the paradigm are, first of all, the idea of corporate liability. The idea that the principal sanctions will be imposed on the corporations that employ or whose agents pay bribes instead of on the individual agents. Right? So that's one idea, or instead of on the public officials, the foreign public officials, but the idea of focusing the enforcement efforts and the sanctions on the corporations, that's really quite critical. Secondly, the idea that the sanctions are quite high-powered. Right? As many of you know, the reason why uh, the FCPA gets so much attention these days is because the penalties for violations are quite significant. First of all, the monetary penalties can range from, say, at the low end, $1 million dollars, right up to $1.6 billion, which is what Siemens paid in 2008. So that's enough to, I presume, get the attention of practi practitioners, CEOs, etc., etc. That's why I take it many of you are here, because <laughs> those sanctions are so high-powered. But the sanctions go beyond just the mon monetary penalties. They also <coughs> include the risk of debarment, so the idea that a company that has been Uh, found guilty, convicted, found liable for uh, violating the statute can be uh, barred from government contracts for some period of time. Right? 
So in the European Union, there's automatic debarment for firms that are convicted uh, of corruption. In the US and the UK, it's discretionary. The UK somehow got around the EU directive. Right? And I gather it's part of the new Bra Brazilian legislation as well, the provision for debarment. So that's a big concern. Oh, and I should mention also the World Bank and the other development banks have provisions for debarment. So firms that engage in corrupt practices and fi in projects that are financed by the World Bank will be eligible for debarment. And then they've entered into a cross-debarment agreement with a lot of the other development banks. So basically, if you commit corrupt acts in a project that's financed by the World Bank, then the IDB, will, the Inter-American Development Bank, will automatically debar you as well. So this is another significant penalty for firms that do a lot of business with governments or a lot of business that's financed by one of the development banks. Okay? So those are the two sanctions that are, re receive a lot of attention. But there's a third type of sanction that I think is worth mentioning, which is that firms that are found liable, I'll, I think I'll use that term, that are found liable by the US authorities often enter into agreements of some sort, pretrial agreements. They resolve the charges against them through some sort of pretrial agreement with the Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission that, and or the Securities Exchange Commission, that will say things like, you have to adopt a compliance program, right, an anti-corruption compliance program. You have to train your employees. You have to hire a compliance officer who reports directly to the board. In some cases, they're required to appoint an independent monitor who will report back to the Department of Justice about the firm's progress in implementing its obligations under this agreement. So that kind of direct regulation, very firm-specific regulation, it's a form of sanction because it's, com it's difficult for the firms to comply with, and it's somewhat unique um, uh, in, in, in um, corporate law to this area. This is the main area where these types of agreements have been used. So that's a package of sanctions that I'm calling the high-powered sanctions associated with um, uh, anti-corruption law. And that model of entering into agreements, having these high-powered sanctions, is one that's global. It's not just under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that you see these types of sanctions being used, but the British do it, the World Bank does it, and as I understand, the proposal is that Brazilian regulators will do that too, okay? Prosecutorial control. Because virtually all these cases are resolved by way of agreement instead of a trial, prosecutors end up not only deciding who is liable by deciding who to prosecute, they also end up setting the penalties effectively. They are essentially performing the sentencing function that we normally think of as being performed by judges, right? So prosecutors have a lot of power in this regime. They are really the people who are driving the regime. And again, you see that in the US, but it seems to be working the same way in the UK and in the World Bank's um, debarment system as well. So that's another key feature of this regime that I think is worth thinking about. It's very different from the idea of judges or the legislatures, legislators setting the penalties. It's really being driven and uh, controlled by the prosecutors. And then finally, something that's attracted a lot of attention, especially outside of the US, is the fact that this law is being applied extraterritorially. So the US has been very aggressive in asserting jurisdiction over firms that it thinks have violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So basically, the statute applies to not just firms that commit acts of bribery in the US. You know, you get on the phone in New York and agree to pay a bribe in Argentina. That's, that's clear. You're also liable, according to the prosecutors at least, if you're, if you're a US firm and your employee in Argentina gets on the phone to the guy in the next building and pays the bribe, right? So even if there's no connection to the US, aside from the fact that your firm is incorporated in the US, the FCPA applies, right? It applies on the basis of nationality, right? So that's a fairly aggressive uh, way of uh, asserting jurisdiction. But on top of that, it applies to all firms that have securities listed on a US exchange, so long as some act in furtherance of the bribe involves use of what they call interstate commerce in the US, right? Um, in practical terms, according to the prosecutors, this means that if your bribe involves any sort of wire transfer through the US, right? So if you make a payment to someone else that is somehow routed through the US financial system, 
that's enough to trigger U.S. jurisdiction. So the FCPA seems to apply to just about every bribe that involves a payment in U.S. dollars going through the financial system, right? That's particularly aggressive because then that captures a lot of uh, transactions and a lot of firms that have very little connection to the U.S. And then finally, in the most aggressive ex ex uh, application of the statute, they've applied it to firms whose activities have absolutely no connection to the U.S., except that they were conspiring with U.S. firms. So in one particular case, just to give an example, there was a Nigerian oil project that involved a liquefied natural gas uh, facility being constructed by a variety of firms from France, from Italy, from the U.S., and from Japan. And they all agreed to pay bribes to various officials in the Nigerian government. The Japanese company was prosecuted under the FCPA simply because it was conspiring with a U.S. firm. They couldn't find any connection between what the Japanese firm did and the United States. They didn't send money through the U.S. Their officials never had anything to do with the U.S. You know, they're not incorporated in the U.S. They were, this is all about a project on an island off of Nigeria. But just because they were conspiring with U.S. firms, the prosecutors argued that was enough to ground jurisdiction in the U.S. And for reasons that I'll explain later, they, the Japanese company didn't think it could fight that. Right? The prosecutor's word was final, and they paid hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties. Right? So that's the last component of this regime that I want to focus on. So I'll take them in turn, the corporate liability, <coughs> the sanctions, the idea of prosecutors having control, and then finally, the extraterritoriality. So let's talk about the idea of corporate, criminal li or corporate liability, right? which is I take it um, novel in the Brazilian context. What's the rationale? The idea is that these types of offenses, com offenses committed in an organizational setting, are not just matters of individual responsibility. They're really organizational misconduct. It's, we're dealing with organizational forms of misconduct. Right? So that's the idea, because even if one person ultimately hands over the envelope or authorizes the wire transfer, there's usually a group of other people who either help them do it or agreed that they should do it or encouraged them to do it or turned a blind eye as they were doing it. Right? So it's really an organizational problem. It certainly benefits the organization. If, so that's the, the theory. Right? But I think the rationale for corporate liability is really a very instrumental one. The idea is that by targeting the corporation for liability, we can get them to help combat corruption, help fight corruption on the part of their agents. And there's several ways in which the firm can do that. It can do it by preventing corrupt activity, right? by not giving people the opportunities to work in places where they're likely to be asked to pay bribes or where they're likely to be tempted to pay bribes. They can do it by changing their reward structures, their compensation schemes, so you don't get bonuses based on getting big contracts from officials in uh, corrupt countries. You get paid maybe a flat rate if you're doing business in let me pick on Nigeria, for instance. Right? So that kind of, there are those kinds of preventative mechanisms they can take. Or the corporation can engage in monitoring. Right? So it can go out of its way to see whether its agents have engaged in corrupt activity, do the audits, right? collect the data, force people to take vacations so you can go through their records to see what they've been, uh, what they've been up to. Right? And then, if you find anything, you can engage in policing. You can actually discipline the employees. Right? You can, say, demote them or reduce their bonus. Right? So the monitoring and policing is something that the firm is uh, particularly well su suited to do. And if it can't do, it, it do that, because there, there are always limits to what the firm can do, then they can also report. They can report their employees' misconduct to state authorities who can then punish the employees. And that's an important function that the firm can do. So the firm really become, is, is deputized to assist the prosecutors, the state, in either preventing corrupt activity or punishing it after the fact, detecting and punishing it after the fact. And that's very useful in a context where it would be difficult for the state to identify all the people who are involved in, in, in paying the bribe or to punish them. Right? So that's the theory, that's the rationale for going after the corporation, to trigger all of those kinds of activities. So what are the concerns, right? Um, I think the main concern is that 
you don't want to forget about the individuals, right? At the end of the day, it's still, there's still people who are doing the wrong thing, and you don't want to forget about that. And you don't want a regime of corporate liability to divert attention away from the need to impose individual liability, right? So that's, in the US, a big part of the debate. There's been a lot of concern that there are 12, 20 prosecutions under the FCPA each year of corporations, <coughs> and relatively few proceedings against individuals. Right? And there's a concern that it's relatively easy for the prosecutors to go after the corporations, but the individuals are not so easy. Because it turns out that when you threaten someone with going to jail, they resist, they put up a fight. <laughs> um, so virtually all of the corporate cases have been resolved by some sort of pretrial agreement, and relatively few of the individual ones have been. The individual cases are the ones that go to trial. So they're expensive for the prosecutors. Right? Um, so they've got a natural tendency to you know, just focus on the relatively easy cases. And that's a problem, because I think everyone would agree that you need to complement corporate liability with some sort of inf individual liability, but you have to find some way to keep the prosecutors interested in going after the individuals. Right? What are the solutions to that? All I can think of is some way of creating a high-level commitment to individual prosecutions, whether that's having some sort of quota for the number of individual prosecutions or having a separate unit that does the individual prosecutions, which I guess is effectively what will occur in the Brazilian context. So that might be enough to address that problem. But it is a concern, right? because it really is much easier to just go after the corporations under a regime um, like this one, where the corporations have virtually um, no defense. Right? Okay, so that's one concern. There's a second concern. I should have said at the outset, and I think Oscar might have alluded to this, my interest in this field flows from my general interest in developing countries and the problems of development and the role that law can play in promoting economic development. Right? So that's why I care about uh, anti-corruption law. I care about the fact that corruption of this kind, transnational corruption, can lead to firms putting workers in buildings that fall down, right? Or bridges being built that will collapse, mm -hmm. right? Or pollution, right? That's the, those are the kind of consequences that I'm concerned about. There are other reasons why people are interested in anti-corruption law. Some people are, in, in the US are worried just about the competitive effects and so forth, but that's not actually my interest, right? So I'm interested in the extent to which the law actually prevents corruption and the kind of corruption that's harmful to developing societies. Okay. So with that in mind, when I look at a regime that focuses heavily on uh, corporate liability or even individual <coughs> liability, I wonder, well, what about the other side? You know, a bribe takes at least two people. It takes the person paying and the person receiving. So what about the officials who, uh, who accept or even solicit the bribes? You worry that a regime that's entirely focused on going after the corporations will forget about and will, be, will divert attention from the task of possibly proceeding against the foreign officials who are accepting the bribes. Now, there are some obvious difficulties with proceeding against foreign public officials as opposed to corporations, but they're not insurmountable. You, it, is, it does happen, right? So, for example, in the United States, we do have proceedings from time to time against foreign public officials for their corrupt activity. So, in, some of you would know about the indictment of... Um, uh, Paolo Malufi, 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 Maluf, Malufi, um, right? That's under New York state law for receiving stolen property, right? There have been prosecutions of Haitian officials who were paid bribes by U.S. companies, telecommunications officials who were paid bribes by U.S. companies. They were prosecuted for money laundering in the U.S., but it's all coming out of the bribery. Recently, there was a case against um, an official of the Venezuelan Development Bank Right, Bandes, um, a senior official of the development bank, it took bribes from a U.S. broker dealer, right, a U.S. investment company, uh, because they wanted the bank's business. So she routed the business to the bank in exchange for sev several million dollars worth of bribes, and she was prosecuted. So she was prosecuted along with the people who paid bribes. They prosecuted the bribe pairs under the FCPA. They prosecuted her for money laundering and then in a funny way for violation of the New York State statute on commercial bribery. 
It's an interesting case in its own right. But again, the point is there are legal mechanisms that can be deployed to go after foreign public officials, and sometimes they will be effective, right? Because there are going to be cases where one country will have the ability to assert power over the officials of another one, right? So because the officials have assets in that country, or they, so they've got assets overseas, or they want to travel overseas, right? So at le the very least, uh, I don't think uh, Mr. Malufi is going to be traveling to New York too soon. Um, in the case of the Haitian officials, uh, the, they were actually residing in Florida part of the time, as many Haitians do, so they're in jail now. Um, the Venezuelan official was arrested in Miami, right, because people certainly go through Miami, so it is possible. And again, the concern is that if it's too easy to pursue corporate liability, you'll divert attention away from this other aspect of anti-corruption law, which is prosecuting the officials, right? And it's, a, again, something to look out for if your concern is using this type of law to actually uh, uh, reduce corruption for the benefit of societies. Okay. The sanctions. So, like I said, the sanctions can be significant. Um, just focusing on the money for a second, last year was a very slow year in FCPA prosecutions. Right? There were only 12 proceedings, 12 proceedings against separate companies, that is. Um, the fines still averaged over $20 million, right? So the U.S. collected $260 million in penalties from under the FCPA in a, what was considered to be a very slow year. So these are significant penalties. So, and then of course there are the other consequences I mentioned, the, de the potential for debarment and the, the, all the terms and conditions in the pretrial agreements. So what's the rationale for these very high-powered sanctions? Well, part of it is based on the theory of deterrence, right? The idea that if the benefits of committing a crime are high, but the probability of being detected and prosecuted are low, then you're naturally going to need very high penalties in order to deter the crime. You're going to need penalties that are at least equal to the amount of the benefit, but actually, you're going to need more than that. You're going to have to multiply the amount of the, 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 amount of the penalty, amount of the benefit, by the inverse of the probability of being detected, right? So if you're only being caught half the time, you're going to have to make them pay double the amount of the benefit to make up for the time, the other time that they're not being caught. So that's the theory, that there's a low probability of detection, and that's why we need to have high penalties. Of course, some people would argue that the penalties under U.S. law are not high enough because they're actually capped at twice the gain or loss, right? At least the criminal side. And the, on the other side, on the civil side, it's still limited to disgorgement. So you may not get past maybe three times the benefit um, under U.S. law, and that might not be enough. It may be that you, there's less than a one in three chance of being uh, caught um, for these types of corrupt activities. But let's. I think a lot of people think of these penalties as high, so let's run with that idea, that these are relatively high-powered sanctions. Right. So, why, oh sorry, and I should mention the argument for um, the compliance programs and the direct regulation, the firm-specific regulation, because that's also quite mysterious. Why are co prosecutors getting involved in corporate governance? Right. They're running companies saying, well, you need to appoint this person who's at, you know, just below the board level. Right. It's like really getting their hands dirty and getting right into the boardroom. The argument there is that some companies just aren't going to respond to any penalty, no matter how high, and so they have to take a more hands-on approach. So that's the rationale for that type of, um, <coughs> for that aspect of the, the sanctions. Okay, so do these, does this approach make sense? What are the, the costs or the risks? Well, the costs are really, if they're too high, you risk putting companies out of business. And putting companies out of business in, these, in this economic climate is not something that any state should really be going out of its way to do, right? It destroys jobs, it destroys productive investment or reduces productive investment, and that's a cost to society, right? So that's a cost that's often borne even in the jurisdiction where the company is located. But the costs, 
overseas can be even more significant. The idea that you're going to start discouraging p uh, companies from investing in high-risk countries, right? That's going to be the effect of these sanctions. They're going to engage in prevention. They're going to stop investing in countries where there's a risk that their agents will engage in, in corruption. That might not be a good thing, right? So, for example, um, as many of you know, a, couple, a few years ago, ha Haiti suffered a tremendous earthquake, right? Haiti is also known for being a very corrupt country, lots of, especially, well, at all levels, but um, th that's the perception. There was actually some very serious discussion of whether it would be appropriate to suspend the application of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to Haiti for the purposes of encouraging people to invest. The argument was it's not possible for people to invest in Haiti if they're liable to being prosecuted under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It's just, you can't do it. You can't do business in Haiti without engaging in corrupt practices, but at the same time, we want people to do business in Haiti because the society is collapsing and needs this external investment. And it was a real dilemma. Of course, there was no legal way that I can think of to suspend the operation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in relation to one country, but that debate, at least, the fact that people were seriously having that debate illustrates the dilemma, illustrates the idea that you know, there is a cost to these high-powered sanctions. This idea of deterrence can be taken too far in the sense that it deters what might be socially valuable activities, both in the home country and in the country of the investment. So that's the, um, the, the concern. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, actually, in the US, um, we may soon I wouldn't be surprised if there was some movement away from what I'm calling the paradigm of high-powered sanctions. I don't know how many of you have heard about the whistleblower provisions of Dodd-Frank. How many of you? Is this? Okay, so the people have been advertising. I, uh, <laughs> there are now these law firms that are advertising for whistleblowers. I don't know if you've heard about this. So for those of you who haven't heard, I should back up and explain. Uh, in the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, the massive um, revision of the U.S. financial regulation that was passed a couple of years ago. There's a provision that allows the Securities and Exchange Commission to award um, bounties, basically, of up to 30 percent of the amounts that they recover to people who provide information, right? So if you provide information that leads to in, an enforcement action, and as a result of that enforcement action, the SEC collects, or the SEC or other organizations collect more than a million dollars, right, from the defendant, you as the whistleblower get a share of that, and up to 30 percent. And given the numbers that are at stake in FCP, FCPA proceedings, that can be a lot of money, right? So 30 percent of a hundred million dollar award, that's pretty good, right? A 300 million dollar award, even better, 800 million dollars in Siemens, that's real money, right? So this assumption that the probability of detection <laughs> is, going to be, is going to remain low for corrupt activity may not be valid for much longer. Because now anyone in the company, all those sales and marketing people, all the people in the back office handling the accounting, sort of papering over the, the illicit payments, they, if they figure out what's going on, they have, an they have an incentive to send an email to the SEC and try to get a share of the money, right? So we may be moving to a regime where there's a much higher probability of, dis of detection, and the same deterrence logic that I mentioned is just, that's being used to justify the current regime would suggest that the penalties should come down significantly, right? So that might be one way to go. And I, get, I don't think there's any equivalent um, in the Brazilian context, but I'd be curious, actually, maybe this is something we can talk about in the discussion period, about whether there's any, um, there'd be any interest in creating a whistleblower program uh, to complement the new uh, corporate liability. Okay, so that's one alternative to the high-powered sanctions. The other one, of course, um, this isn't doing away with the sanctions, but it is interesting that all these penalties, the six billion dollars or so that have been collected um, uh, as a result of FCPA actions uh, over the past decade or so, it all goes to the U.S. Treasury. Right? All that money, all those fines and penalties, the disgorgement and so on, goes to the U.S. government and stays there. Even though, by definition, the harm 
at least some of the harm, is being suffered overseas, right? These are, this is just the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, right? These corrupt practices, you have to assume, are at least in part harming people in foreign countries. So why is it that the amounts that are being recovered go exclusively to the U.S. government? I think if we're thinking about reforming this regime, it would make sense to consider looking at ways of sending some of the, those uh, recoveries to the countries where the victims are located, right? Either through the state or, if you can figure out how to identify them, to the victims themselves. Right? There are some cases, a handful of cases, in, at least in the US, where this has been done, but very, very few. It's a tiny amount of money that's been sent back. Other countries have done a little bit more, and the World Bank now seems to be committed to um, sending restitution back to the state, uh, or, um, sending funds that are paid in restitution under their sanctions program back to the state where the harm was committed. Uh, but certainly the US practice is to keep the money. Right? might want to think about changing that. What I found interesting in looking at the new Brazilian legislation is that that might be built in. And again, I'm wondering, for those of you who've looked at it, if you look at uh, Article 24, the provision that says that the money, any, well, at least the penalties that are paid by corporations under the, stat under the, under the law, should be used to compensate the organ of government that was harmed, right? In a case of foreign bribery, I would argue that the organ that's been harmed is an organ or a branch of the foreign state. I don't know if that's what was intended by the legislator, but as I read the law, and of course I'm a, uh, not even an American lawyer, I'm a Canadian lawyer, but um, as I read the law, it suggests that there's a pretty strong argument that funds recovered in Brazil for f acts of foreign bribery should be paid to the foreign state. So this problem may not arise in the Brazilian context. Okay. So let me turn to the next issue. All right. This issue of prosecutorial control. Why does this happen? Right. So it's basically because people are afraid of going to trial. It just, corporations, not afraid, but they, it's not worth their while to go to trial. It's too costly, right? Um, it's costly for the prosecutors too. Of course, the prosecutors find it much easier to just sign an agreement as opposed to going to trial and being forced to present proof of corruption. These are, you know, complex economic crimes, lots of evidence, paper, you know, that's a big deal to go to trial. So th there are obvious costs for the prosecution. That's why they prefer a pretrial agreement. On the firm side, you've got all those costs as well, the direct costs of trial, right? And there's little benefit. They have almost no chance of winning, right, under this regime of um, where any act of their employee is attributed to them. And go, if they go to trial and lose, then they have the, the risk of debarment, certainly in the European Union. And also, over the course of the trial, there's bad publicity, right? Every day that the trial goes on, there's going to be a reporter there, at least in the big case, and you won't just have one bad news day, the way you do with an agreement, but you'll have lots of bad news days. So that's why, from the firm's perspective, trials are very costly. So there's a deal to be made there. Prosecutors don't want trials. Firms don't want trials. That's why we don't have trials. But that means everything is settled through these agreements, and the prosecutors and the firms work out the terms of them with relatively little judicial oversight. The worry there about prosecutors um, really shaping everything without that kind of oversight is it's not clear that prosecutors' interests are fully aligned with the interests of either the jurisdiction where they're employed or the jurisdictions where the victims are. Because prosecutors like easy cases that are high profile, right, for sort of obvious reasons. I think that's, I'm not speaking out of turn and asserting that. Those are not necessarily the cases that are most important in terms of things like development, right? So prosecutors might choose to go for, the, what the US prosecutors do is they pick industries, certain industries, and they make sweeps. So they'll do oil and gas and do 10 oil and gas cases in a row. 
and it's easy for them because they develop expertise and they go after one firm, that firm explains, okay, here's what we're doing, we'll settle with you, and by the way, here's what our competitors are doing, and they get tips and so on and so on. They just work their way down the chain. Just bang, 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 yeah. right? Relatively straightforward. But prosecutors, the, the resulting pattern of enforcement may not be what would be optimal from a social perspective, right? So you can imagine a very different way of doing things where, say, the U.S. prosecutors would ask different countries, well, where's your corruption problem? What should be our priority? Right? So they could go to Angola, and the Angolans could say, well, it's infrastructure. They could go to Haiti. In Haiti, they would say, it's customs. They could go to Argentina. They would say, well, it's healthcare, maybe, right? In some places, it might be oil and gas. Might, maybe they'd say that in Ni Nigeria, maybe not, right? So that's the, that would be a very different process where the priorities would be set, the enforcement priorities would be set, not just by a bunch of foreign prosecutors, but in consultation with the affected societies, right? Going further, you could say, well, we're not gonna prosecute at all. We might collect evidence when we get one of these tips and then refer it to the local prosecutors. Right? We'll refer it to the Haitian prosecutors, refer it to the Angolan prosecutors, etc. Or if you don't trust the prosecutors, but you trust the courts, you would actually think of proceeding directly in the foreign courts. I'm just throwing these ideas, I'm just throwing these ideas out there, but just to highlight the fact that it's a little strange to have the anti-corruption strategies for a lot of countries around the world being decided by a handful of prosecutors in Washington, D.C., basically. Right? Okay. The last issue, the extraterritoriality. I explained basically how it works, that there, were, there are very, very few limits on uh, U.S. jurisdiction under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, at least according to the Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission. Right? That's just been their practice. And it hasn't been challenged very often because none of these cases go to trial. Right? So that Japanese company I told you about, that was prosecuted because it conspired with the Americans in the Nigerian project, they just couldn't risk going to trial, they felt. It's a massive engineering company. The risk of being convicted, um, you know, getting a real conviction as opposed to the sort of agreement they got, um, would have been too serious given the risk of debarment. Right? So they just couldn't afford that kind of risk. They went to trial, uh, they, they settled without challenging the jurisdictional claim. Right? Why do we do this? Well, internationally, under the OECD convention, there's been a real push to have countries assert jurisdiction very broadly. Right? This way, lots of different countries are in a position to prosecute a company. Right? And, and if you start from the premise that anti-corruption law was not being enforced enough, it makes sense to try to increase the level of enforcement by giving lots of people the opportunity to enforce. Right? So that's, I think, the rationale behind um, behind doing this. Right? The problem is that there's really no formal mechanism for coordinating the enforcement activities of all these different countries. Right? And this is, I suspect some of you know, a bit of a nightmare for companies. Right? If you are a company that's paid bribes around the world and you're also a multinational, right? so let's say you're a Brazilian company doing business in a set of African countries, uh, maybe a little bit of business in, uh, in Asia, a lot in the rest of Latin America. Of course, you're liable to be prosecuted, and you've got shares listed in the United States, let's say, right? possibly in Europe. And you're, some of the business is done, is conducted by subsidiaries in a bunch of other countries. Right? You're now liable to be prosecuted, not only by Brazil, but by the US, by all the, country, all the countries where you're actually paying the bribes, the countries where your shares are listed, besides the US, and any other country that the money passed through, right? So you wanna settle, right? You wanna reach some sort of agreement, you don't wanna go to trial, et cetera. What you have to do is reach a global agreement, right? Otherwise, what you'll end up doing is you'll settle with the US Department of Justice and they will issue the press release, they'll publish this agreement where you agree to a whole set of facts saying, here's what I did in, in Angola, here's what I did in Mozambique, and so on. The Brazilian authorities will take that press release and take that, uh, that statement of facts and use it as a roadmap to their own prosecution. That's your concern, that if you can't get a global agreement with all of the uh, pos potential regulators, all the jurisdictions, <coughs> then they'll just come after you one by one. 
right? And you'll end up paying over and over and over again. Because not only is there no way to, no formal way to enter into this sort of global agreement, there are no legal rules that limit the jurisdiction of, say, the subsequent countries. There's no nebisi nidem principle. Right? There's no double jeopardy internationally for, in a lot of jurisdictions. So you could literally end up being prosecuted twice, three times, and so forth. So that absence of coordination mechanisms is a problem. It leads to the risk of over-enforcement that I identify on the slide. Of course, there's also the risk of under-enforcement, which is that since everyone can prosecute, no one will want to be the first one. They'll all say, well, let the other guys go first, and that, let them do the work. Right? It's hard to predict which way it will work out. Either way, we know it's not optimal. Right? And so I think going forward, especially because of pressure from firms, we'll see a lot of attention being paid to mechanisms for at least ensuring voluntary cooperation, mechanisms for helping people enter into, helping firms, firms are not people, helping firms um, enter into these kinds of global agreements, right? So that's one direction that I think, I'd actually predict that, we'll see that. Um, you could imagine a legal solution as well, you know, sort of jurisdictional rules that, you know, you could have double jeopardy rules being adopted and so forth. Or what I would advocate for is some sort of complementarity principle, right? That, coming back to my development focus, some way to make sure the interests of the, <coughs> the victim country are protected and respected, right? Some way to say that, say, well, the prosecutors in the country where the bribes were paid, they get the first shot at the company, not just the official, but the company that paid the bribes. If they're not willing to make a genuine effort, then okay, the foreign actors can get involved. Right? But, you know, if it's Angola, Angola should have the first crack at Petrobras, right? And only if they are unwilling to proceed will the, or unable to proceed, will the Brazilian authorities uh, move forward. That kind of principle, the adoption of that kind of principle, would, I think, make a lot of sense if you're concerned about the broader development implications of this, okay? The effects of this kind of regime on the host countries. Okay. So that's... Those are the key elements of what's being done uh, that I wanted to highlight and why there, I think there really are some issues uh, around, some questions to be asked about whether this is a, a worthwhile paradigm. But ultimately, whether it is, this is the right direction to be going in, whether this is the right model or not, I think is an empirical question, right? Or at least in part an empirical question. And so that suggests there are a whole bunch of questions we need to ask that we need to an answer before we can decide, you know, is this model working or should we be pursuing any of the alternatives that I've uh, discussed? Right. So we need to ask, well, we need to figure out exactly how is law being enforced. So we just need basic data on that. Then we need to know, well, what do people think, how do people think it's being enforced? Then, well, and what are they doing in response to that? And then what are the consequences? What is this doing to the level of corrupt activity? And of various types, you know, in various sectors, various levels of government, high level, low level, and so forth. You know, if we really want to understand how the law is working and what effects it's having, we can do it in a systematic way. Those are the kinds of questions you have to ask. And then ultimately, I think we should be asking, well, what are the effects on society and the economy, right? So, we don't have that information, and people don't seem to be that interested in collecting it right now. There's a lot of data on, quantitative data, on the prosecutions. We know that. I can tell you exactly how many proceedings have been launched under the FCPA, how much they've, been, how many, how much they've collected, <laughs> where the firms were based. I've got a whole database of that, right? And I can do a statistical analysis of the way in which the law is being enforced, right? We, have, we don't have much on people's perceptions, and we don't know much about how firms are reacting. And so, now I'm going to speak to the academics in the room. This would be a perfect time for people to start, for researchers to start doing qualitative research inside firms to look at how they're reacting to the new law. Right? How are they changing their practices? Right? How are they changing their attitudes towards overseas bribery? To do, you know, and to... I could imagine an ethnographic analysis where you start following people and just over the time and over the next 12 months seeing how their attitudes towards foreign bribery change, right? I think that kind of research will be uh, particularly valuable. Um, and then, of course, we need better data on the prevalence of corruption. We have these perception surveys, right? They're not terribly useful. We have slightly better data on perceptions of bribe paying by country, 
and by sector with the Transparency International uh, Bribe Payers Index, but it's not so great. Right? And I know it's hard to measure corruption, but we could do a bit better, right? Um, so there's room for that. And then, of course, the effects, right? And that's the last stage. And it's, that's easy to collect in a way, but tracing the connections, tracing the causal connections between the way the law is being enforced and what firms are doing to the level of corruption and to the broader economic effects, that actually requires very rigorous uh, um, empirical analysis and theoretical analysis. And so, again, speaking to the academics in the room, I think this is a perfect, <laughs> this is a perfect time to be doing that kind of work in Brazil, just like it's a great time to be doing it everywhere el else in the world. Okay? And I think only once we have that research will we have a sense of whether this new global paradigm really makes sense uh, for any country, including Brazil. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, with that, I'll close and turn it over to my commentators. So, thanks. So good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, I have many comments to make. Uh, congratulations, Kevin. It was a terrific presentation. I think you uh, summarized what's going on in this area uh, in a very synthetic, and, and you picked up many different problems, problems that are usually think by lawyers, problems that is, are think, thought by uh, developmental policymakers. Um, I want to make a, I don't know, maybe two or three, co I have eight here, but I'm going to pick up two or three because I just want you to hear what you have to say or ask. I'm, I'm much more interested on that. Uh, putting together a few things that Kevin said about corporate liability, which I think is the high-profile issue right now in Brazil with the new law. Uh, I just want to uh, say something about a very recent example from Chile, which is uh, absolutely different from what's going on in the US. They pass a law on corporate criminal liability, not administrative as, as yours, but the effects are probably the same. Yeah, very close. They did it just to enter into the OECD in 2009. Uh, companies are liable for uh, foreign bribery, uh, money laundering, and financing of terrorism. So you can see it's just for uh, um, comply with the very, very basic rules of the uh, OECD. They applied just a few money laundering cases in the last years, and a few months ago they applied for the first time to a bribery case. And they did it against a Chilean company and um, it's, a, it's a paint company that pay a uh, small amount of money to a mayor in a municipality outside of Santiago to get a license to uh, produce paint, which is toxic. Uh, it may harm the environment. Uh, and they got a permission to do it in a residential area, which is, of course, against the environmental laws. Uh, they pay almost the, the case was settled in the same way Kevin was explaining. The incentives for companies are the same. The prosecutors were uh, asking themselves which would be the most or the best social outcome of the case because they, there was a very high profile case. There was a social demand for, uh, you know, applying very high penalties, but high penalties in the Chilean law is closing the company. But if you close the company, shareholders can get the money out, uh, li liquidate the assets, and you have 2,000 people in the streets, which is not a very good social outcome. So they continue the uh, individual um, criminal cases against the public officials and the officials of the company that were uh, engaged in the uh, corrupt activity. Uh, but they settle with the company in a very um, environmentally friendly way. They ask the company to uh, give the property to the community. They build a park. They clean the area. They paint the facades of all the uh, houses surrounding the area. They uh, provide medical equipment for all the um, hospital and small uh, medicine facilities of the community for breath um, disease. Um, they put a big sign saying, we did all of this not because we are good people, just because we pay a bribe and, and this is our penalty. Uh, so it's a reputational cost as well. 
and, and they continue the prosecution against the uh, official. I think this is, this is something to keep in mind because I suspect, I'm not very, uh, I've been here many times and, and I'm not, but I don't want to presume that I know how the criminal law is applied in Brazil, but I suspect that it suffered from the same deficiencies that uh, we suffer in the rest of the region, meaning that powerful offenders are usually above the law. Uh, they find a way to escape the uh, penalties. So the, the high power sanctioning Kevin was referring that is going on in the US, it might not be the case in our countries. So I think that, that we need to find our own way to make the best good use of these laws without creating unemployment, uh, without uh, putting people out of business just uh, because the law allows the prosecutors to do that, but finding uh, social uh, solutions that, um, yeah, finally uh, ends up with the outcomes of the law. This is uh, one comment that I would like to make. The second one is that uh, Kevin is a very idealistic uh, scholar, and he wants the US to share the money or to ask the uh, developing countries for their uh, priorities. And I don't think this is impossible. I'm, I'm myself conducting research on uh, um, asset recovery and how much money is supposed to be back to the developing world in this uh, proceedings. The US collected almost $6 billion in the last 15 years, uh, uh, $6 billion in English figures, so uh, a lot of money. They just get back 3% of that money in a very, um, in, in a few cases, and, and I'm studying the mechanisms for developing countries to access to that money. Contrary to most of our um, intuitions, the, 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 there is a problem that it seems that we need to deal with, which is that it seems to be the case that usually developing countries are not interested in getting the money back. And this is not because they don't need or they don't want the money, but because corruption causes political noises uh, in the domestic arena and Politicians usually would like to keep the things low. A few millions can be good, but you know, a scandal is even worse. So I know many people in the US asking exactly the same question Kevin is asking for, and actually they are acting either in the World Bank or in the uh, um, DOJ, and they are trying to find you know, the right vehicles to channel this uh, money. There are also opposite examples, as, as there was a, a recent case of uh, Costa Rica uh, actually going to the U.S. and requesting the money back, and, the, and a U.S. district attorney in Miami saying, I'm sorry, you are not a victim. You are an accomplice of this case. You are a co-conspirator of this case. So uh, still a lot of things to do in this uh, turning of the uh, corruption from protecting U.S. interests, which I believe is still very much the case in, under U.S. law to more developmental objectives. That I don't think is, uh, is an impossible task. I think the U.S. can do a very good PR exercise by uh, doing this, uh, but I feel that we are still very far away. So I stop here so uh, Carlos can do their comments and then we can discuss. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure, uh, Professor Kevin, to watch one of your uh, lectures. Uh, again, I would like to make a few comments about uh, self-disclosure and cooperation, which I think plays a very important role uh, uh, in the FCPA. Uh, for example, in 2010, uh, the SEC and the DOJ had 45 people that work with uh, investigations related to compliance matters, and they were uh, handling around 140 cases which are very complex and most of them, you know, takes place overseas. So you can just handle uh, that amount of matters at the same time when you, you know, you rely also on, on self-disclosure and corporations of the companies. Uh, and that plays a very important uh, role uh, for uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, 
Uh, and from a government perspective, the self-disclosure and cooperation is very important because the government can use uh, its resource in a more uh, effective way. Uh, and this was incorporated uh, in the Brazilian law that was passed and, and, and published uh, on Friday. Uh, from the first time on the anti-corruption arena for corporations, the corporations will get credit for uh, self-disclosure and cooperation uh, in Brazil. And that's uh, interesting because uh, I work on a few cases in which we were working for the subsidiary of uh, U.S. companies doing business in Brazil. They decided to self-disclose to the DOJ and SEC, but not to the Brazilian authorities. They considered that. They thought that was the most ethical uh, thing to do, but at the end of the day, they decided not to do so because the company could be debarred, could uh, you know face uh, uh, <coughs> very harsh uh, penalties. So I think this new legislation might be able uh, to fix uh, a little bit uh, of this, uh, this issue. And uh, the global uh, agreement that uh, Professor Kevin mentioned, it's very important. I think these days we cannot think about just on our uh, local level. We know we need to think as uh, global impacts that our conducts might have. And it's interesting, uh, if, if we look, I think it was in 2010, the Sadi and Perdigon case in which the uh, officers from Sadi and Perdigon, they settled with the SEC uh, for uh, insider trading. They paid, I think it was around $300,000 to settle the case, which was pretty reasonable. You know, if they, they would take that to court, that would cost like millions of dollars, and they settled without admitting or denying the case. And afterwards, the, the SEC provided all the evidence to the Brazilian prosecutors, and the Brazilian prosecutors brought a case against the individuals, right? And they were uh, convicted at the first, uh, at the district court. They appeal, and apparently that was uh, maintained at the Court of Appeals, and they, I think it's still pending, but it shows how you need to think about uh, playing at a, a global level. And uh, one comment re regarding debarment. Debarment was excluded from the draft bill during the last stage of the legislative process. Uh, it was a point that uh, received a lot of criticism because uh, the OACD convention, uh, anti-bribery convention, mentions that the sanctions need to be uh, dissuasive, effective, and they take into consideration uh, to assess whether or not the, the law is effective and dissuasive. They take into consideration what other countries do. And if we look at the list of possible sanctions uh, that other countries apply, all of them have debarment as one of the the sanctions, which for many companies will be the most uh, effective sanctions, right? So that was uh, excluding uh, during the, uh, the legislative process. And if Professor Kevin could mention a, a little bit more about how, uh, you know, the negative impact that settlements might have on the development of, of the FCPA, uh, and how, how do you see that? The settlement on the development of the law and so of the lift CP. The yes, because for example, we have like the IBM case that took place in Argentina, right? Uh, and IBM uh, in the U.S. it was held liable uh, because of the acts that were took place in Argentina, and there were basically no contacts with the U.S. The only connection was that the you know the books and records of the Argentinian subsidiary were, were consolidated in the U.S. So you know if that case were taken to court. I think it will be interesting to see how the you know the courts would apply because at the end of the day the the law does not say anything about the subsidiaries, right? So and I think that were more uh, uh, or what I have to say, and I wanted to open uh, for for the floor for questions and comments as well. Yes. Uh, quem preferir fazer a pergunta em português, uh, como ele está muito preocupado que a gente garanta a melhor tradução possível para ele da pergunta em inglês, ele, a gente pediria que vocês fizessem por escrito, por favor, porque a gente trabalha na tradução e entrega para ele. Os demais que quiserem fazer as perguntas um, oralmente, podem fazer. Eu vou levar o microfone só em virtude da uh, gravação. Tá bom? Uh, hello, Kevin. Uh, my name is Pedro Augusto. I study law here in São Paulo at University of São Paulo, and I work here in an internship on corporate governance with Professor Mariana Pargender. And I would like to ask you about your general opinion on 
criminal corporate liability, actually the liability of corporations in Canadian law, since you are a Canadian lawyer, <laughs> as you told us, because this is a very important th theme on Brazilian agenda. And there is a great difference, in my opinion, in Brazilian anti-corrupt acts and Chilean law, because in Chile there is the official requirement of a compliance plan. And we don't have this here in Brazil, neither with the new and recent law. So I would like to question you if you think there is a connection between uh, the requirement of compliance plans in firms and the criminal liability of firms, because we don't have this in Brazil. Even, we, yes. even yes. if yes. we have the, the criminal liability for firms here in Brazil, it's not actually applied and it's, it is like a taboo theme here for us. So I'd like to question you if you think that there is a theoretical possibility, if it is a good choice to criminal responsibilized firms. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, my name is Marcelo, and uh, you've touched a, a point that called my attention, uh, which is the t t 2010 Whistleblowers Act, mm -hmm. <coughs> which I think uh, is of big value to the enforcement of the FCPA. But if I, if I recall uh, correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the number of FCPA enforcement cases started to raise a bit before that, I believe under the <laughs> Obama administration, so 27 or something, that the number of cases really uh, raised a lot. And from what I read and heard about this, that is uh, linked with uh, the fact that the US government uh, added uh, strength to the enforcement bodies uh, of the FCPA. And since there's a big question mark in the Brazilian business community with our new legislation, and since we do not have anything equivalent to the Whistleblowers Act, I'd like to understand from you what exactly did the U.S. government uh, did what did what did exactly did they uh, I've read things like they added uh, FBI intelligence to the uh, enforcement bodies and so forth but how did they get all those uh, cases how did they learn about the information of the potential FCPA violations I, I believe that maybe learning that we could uh, take that to to our advantage for for our future here thank you I'll take, okay, those two. So first with Pedro, I have to admit, I'm a very, um, I take a very instrumental approach to, and sort of consequentialist approach to understanding uh, or to evaluating legal rules. So when I think about the consequences of criminal liability as opposed to administrative liability as opposed to even civil liability, it's often difficult for me to see the big difference, right? Um, if, assuming the uh, magnitude of the financial penalties are the same and there's a possibility of debarment, all the collateral consequences are similar, what difference does it make whether you call it criminal or civil? The typical answer is that there's greater stigma attached to a criminal uh, uh, conviction. In this context, in the corporate context, if you've said this firm committed corrupt acts, I, I'm just not sure that there'll be much, more six, uh, much additional stigma from saying, well, and therefore they're criminally liable as opposed to just liable under this administrative system. So that's my own perspective on it, but that's coming from very, a very particular way of understanding and evaluating um, the law. So I think, uh, and what's much more important are the, you know, the functional differences. So differences in the sanctions and differences in the attribution rules, right? So there are different ways of imposing corporate criminal liability. You've got the US approach, which is respondeat superior, so that you're liable, for, the corporation is liable for any act of one of its agents, so long as they're acting for the benefit of the corporation. Or you've got the Canadian approach with the identification doctrine, where you're only responsible for the actions of the directing mind of will. Or you can have a, another approach, say the Italian approach, where you're liable for everything, but with a 
compliance defense, a defense of due diligence. So that those kinds of functional differences between the regimes, to me, are more important than the label civil versus criminal. But again, that's just um, my perspective. Um, and so I don't think there's a necessary connection between whether you've got criminal or civil corporate criminal liability and whether you have a requirement of a compliance program. Right? That I don't think necessarily follows. And in fact, we see different combinations um, across jurisdictions of compliance program requirements and corporate civil administrative criminal uh, liability. Okay. On the, Marcelo, on the question of the, what explained the increase in the number of FCPA proceedings, right? Uh, it certainly wasn't the whistleblower legislation because you're quite right to say that the number of uh, prosecutions or number of proceedings and the number of enforcement actions increased significantly well before the whistleblower provisions came into effect. Uh, they've really only just started to kick in. Um, what did explain it? There are several theories out there. Could be the staffing, that's a possibility. It could also be the technology. So uh, I remember in a uh, an interview that Mayra and Guillermo and I uh, did in Washington DC with a couple of Department of Justice prosecutors, they were talking about the, um, how useful it was to have email, right? Yeah. It makes it just so much easier to investigate corruption. What used to be in a phone call, right, is now an email. What used to be, you'd have to, you could only get if you, the, the evidence that you could only get if you were wiretapping people at the time that they were committing the act, now you can get just by looking back in time. It's just like a, a time machine. You can go back and look at all their emails and see exactly what people were agreeing to. So it could just be a technological um, advance that explains it. But I actually think the most uh, compelling explanation is Sarbanes-Oxley, right? The requirement that um, <coughs> the CEOs and the CFOs personally sign the financial statements and attest to their validity. That was what uh, made people, and, and attest to the, uh, the, the, the strength of the internal controls, right? That was what made very high level management take very seriously the idea of non-disclosure. So if they realized, well, we are, we've got sloppy uh, books and records, sloppy accounting, limited internal controls, we might be paying bribes, but now I'm going to be personally liable for not disclosing that. Well, that, that makes a lot of people pause. And so I think a lot of this, the increase in enforcement actions was driven by self-reporting, and the self-reporting was motivated by the Sarbanes-Oxley requirement. So that's, um, I, I think of all the theories I've heard, that's the most uh, uh, important one uh, that explains things. But going forward, I do think the whistleblowing will have an impact. The question really will be whether the, the SEC has enough staff to evaluate all the tips that they receive. Um, I just heard that they've been receiving, at one point uh, last year, shortly after the rules came into effect, they said they were receiving on average eight tips per day, right? That's a lot, right, given the complexity of a lot of these cases. Now that was covering all sorts of violations of the U.S. securities laws, not just the FCPA, but still a good chunk of those would have been FCPA uh, related uh, uh, tips. and it may be difficult for them to sort through all of them and actually make use of, 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 of that information. So their ability to do that, I think, will determine whether or not the whistleblower legislation will actually make it easier to um, detect and prosecute wrongdoing. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Professor Davis, in this country, and in probably many other countries like India, uh, one one uh, area in which there is a tremendous amount of corruption does not necessarily involve paying for something which is illegal or to obtain a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, countries which are highly regulated, like Brazil, in which all kinds of activities require approvals, it's not unusual for companies to pay amounts to officers, to officials, to expedite their matters. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the state of Sao Paulo, if you want to approve a, real estate, a major real estate project, you need the approval of the equivalent to the state EPA, mm -hmm. the Environmental Protection Agency. Usually it takes them two years to approve anything. Mm -hmm. And probably coming in with a wonderful project would still hold you back for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. If you want to launch a new medical product, 
you need the approval from the uh, Ministry of mm -hmm. Health. In order to get something approved, which is perfect everywhere else, you will have to wait in line for several years. So companies find ways uh, to accelerate that. Uh, they are not, in, in providing bribes or lobbies, or you know, you can name it in a different way, uh, they, are not, they are not really doing anything illegal in the sense that they are not trying to prove something which is wrong. They're just trying to expedite the matter. In fact, coming from New York, you may know that in the city of New York, you don't approve anything with the municipality unless you're ready to make the right contributions to the right people, not to approve something wrong, mm -hmm. just to make sure it gets approved on time. So how do you think we can control that? Sorry. Oh, Beron uh, Suchodolsky. So actually, can I ask a question? Um, what, what amounts are you talking about? What amounts of money? Uh, without uh, incriminating yourself or your clients, but uh, <laughs> what's the going rate these days? <laughs> well, well uh, to begin with, I have never been involved in handing out anything like that. Of course not. <laughs> so let's, 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 let, let's clear my record to start right. with. But uh, I hear from people because they talk to me, hmm. and I have to advise international clients and what do I think about what they're doing? But it's not unusual to see demands of $50,000, $100,000, but it's not one mm -hmm. shot. I mean, if you're a developer and you have 100 developments, you have 100 times $50,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where the problems start. Yeah. And there's nothing illegal obtained by the end of the day. Right. It's just obtaining an approval at the right time. Uh, let me give you the party line on this. Uh, the international community generally is um, opposed to creating any sort of exception to the prohibitions on bribery for what are called facilitation payments. So amounts that are being paid to expedite performance of a duty that the official uh, is actually subject to. Right? So, there is, so there is this concept of a facilitation payment or facilitating payment that's used in American law and the, FC, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act has an exception for facilitating payments, but the international community generally, so meaning the OECD Working Group and UNCAC, they are not very thrilled about this idea, um, and they've put out s recommendations suggesting that the exception not be um, relied upon or not be granted and be construed narrowly. Uh, so that's one thing. And actually, the other thing is that in practice, in the United States, the exception has been construed extremely narrowly, at least by the Department of Justice right? and, and the SEC. And of course, what they say matters. So coming back to the last point that Carlos raises, uh, their interpretation of the facilitating payments exception is all that really matters for most companies, because even if a court wouldn't uphold it, you're never getting to court, right? at least in the corporate context. So there are a few ways in which the, the, the definition has been narrowed. First of all, they're absolutely clear on the fact that it has to be for something legal. Right? So if there's any question of paying for an act that's illegal or favor that's illegal, that cannot be a facilitating payment. But the, the, they go further, actually, in the latest guidance they've issued. They'd say, they say that it also has to be a non-discretionary act. So you can make a, f if you pay for something that's totally routine, the official is supposed to do it, just put the stamp on it, that might qualify, but if it's a decision to be made, and it's something like an environmental decision, right, an environmental approval, that sounds like a discretionary decision to me in the, in the most uh, uh, context. Standard, the official line from the US authorities is that payments for that kind of decision will not qualify. They also, and actually, the courts have backed them up on that in a, in, a, in a case involving some individuals. They also say sometimes that, well, there's an enumerated list of examples of things that qualify as facilitating payments, so payments to get your people admitted to the country and for immigration purposes and so on, those count, and there are a few other examples, payments to get utilities connected. I don't think payments for environmental approvals are on the list. And the narrow interpretation of the exception says only enumerated types of payments qualify. 
Um, and then finally, there's the idea that, according to the prosecutors, they have to be small. 50 grand, not so small. Yeah. There, were, there was actually a case involving payments to customs officials in uh, Venezuela, maybe a couple of, um, one or two other countries, that were around two or three thousand dollars. So tiny payments. Those were part of the facts that were the basis for an FCPA settlement. So for all those reasons, I think my advice um, in my legal capacity would be, if, I, if you ask me just as a legal opinion, it's unlikely that those kinds of payments will be um, tolerated by the authorities. Is that a good thing? That's a tough question, right? So this is, goes back to, there's a long-standing debate in the literature on corruption as to whether certain types of corruption are functional as opposed to dysfunctional. So that whether they simply grease the wheels of government, right? That's the argument, that, and we should tolerate that. It's, if you've got an inefficient state, then corruption is actually a functional way of bypassing the inefficiency, right? Bypassing these, you know, cutting the red tape. There's a lot to that, right? And I take it you're somewhat sympathetic to that view. The counter argument is that even bribes paid to cut red tape are pernicious because, for one thing, they encourage officials to generate more red tape in the hopes of getting the bribes. So they'll slow things down, right? They'll make sure the, the, the officials in, Sao in, the, in the government of Sao Paulo will say, of course it's gonna take two years. It may even take three years because the longer it takes going the official route, the more money they collect that in, in your hypothetical. So that's the argument against tolerating those kinds of payments. And that seems to have carried the day recently um, amongst enforcement authorities. So. <clears throat> now, just one comment about your question, uh, or maybe two. One is uh, uh, a very recent case involved in Argentina, my own country. Uh, Ralph Lauren, the uh, cloth company, just pulled out of the country, and they were just paying 50 pesos for moving the, their folders in customs to enter the clothes into the country, to import in, into the country. Uh, I'm sure you are all aware of the uh, crazy regulations we have in the in import-export system right now. Uh, so yeah, very small amount of uh, money in something that everybody knows is going on. You need to put 50 pesos in your folder to move the folder in the Argentine custom. That's every day's uh, work. And there was a case, they closed the uh, facilities in Argentina. And even it was a facilitation payment and the payment was uh, made by a custom broker. So not even the officials of the company were involved. It was a third party in which, you know, the, the, your obligations to comply with the law in regard with the third parties are lower than with your own officials. So third parties, very small amount of money down. No. Security Exchange Commission two months ago. Uh, the, the other possible answer to this is, uh, uh, for sure, uh, the law would, li would like to see the companies doing or advocating, I don't want to use the word lobby, because I know in, uh, in Spanish and probably here has a, may have a negative uh, connotation, but advocating for changing the proceedings. This is the, is following the Kevin's argument. So. Uh, one thing we are trying to do in Argentina is to put many companies together, for example, to deal with this 50 peso thing in customs or to deal with other facilitation payments to approve things in the import-export regime. This is called collective action. It's a new way of, of approaching corruption. It's the, the private sector is taking the lead and saying, we don't, I mean, individually, we can say just, no, and, but if we say no, we are out of business, basically. So they decide to act collectively. And it's, we are just starting, but it seems to be working in some areas. Can I make one, one last comment? Uh, with respect to your point about uh, corporate criminal liability, right? I am uh, in favor of corporate criminal liability. I think it works, but not here in Brazil, I think. Uh, our uh, our uh, criminal procedure has so many uh, appeals, which totally make sense in the context of uh, individuals, right? That it would make hard and complicated enforcement for the government to enforce uh, uh, the law. The Brazilian Congress uh, considered uh, 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 introducing uh, 
corporate criminal liability for a uh, bribery case, but at the end of the day, they decided not uh, to do so because of it would uh, complicate uh, uh, enforcement of the law. And it's interesting because uh, Professor uh, Kevin, for example, when he talks about corporate criminal liability, it's something that exists in the US since 1909, right, with the New York Railroad. And this is a very new concept uh, for us. So, uh, and it's still complicated, right, for those who are practicing law in uh, criminal law. I, I practiced criminal law for a long time. It was like difficult to, to apply that. Judges don't really know how, how to apply a lot of procedural issues. So I think at the end of the day, it was a, a good move. Hi, Professor Davis. My name is Gisela. I'm an attorney in DC. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions, and I, they are sort of related. I'll try to, to keep them short. Um, the first is my impression um, is that a lot of cases in Brazil, uh, a lot of grand corruption schemes in Brazil somehow make use of um, offshore financial centers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, w I, w I wonder how, I, I wonder if that is the case also in the, in the most cases um, prosecuted under the FCPA and how, the, how does the DOJ or the SEC gets around um, this problem. And then this kind of leads into my, my second uh, issue, which is of course, my impression is that obviously you need less evidence to settle than you actually need for trial. So maybe in a way they're in a better position than, um, Brazilian prosecutors, and that's the point I wanted to touch upon. I think from the four um, issues you raised, the one to which we can relate the least is the, the, condi the conditions and the incentives and the control for prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously we have, there's a big difference in, in resources and the way trial is structured in Brazil makes less of an incentive for, for settlement. Um, my impression is also that prosecutors want to be on the publicity of being the ones on trial. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a there's a big burden on justifying a settlement um, a settlement in in Brazil in a corruption case. So I think there are a lot of differences um, in that sense. And I wonder from your exp your experience in, in Brazil and in the U.S. Right. Um, how how do you see Brazilian prosecutors, the challenges that they will face um, within the next few years, and what sort of solutions and alternatives you see for our case? Right, so on the offshore financial centers, do you mean, <coughs> I mean, my impression is that the, those come into play after the official has received the funds, and then they send the money to the Cayman Islands, to Luxembourg, wherever it is, um, to Switzerland, and so forth. So that's after the bribe is paid, and so it's a money laundering issue. The FCPA cases aren't really concerned with that phase of the transaction. They're concerned about how the money gets into the hands of the official, not what the official does with it afterwards. So the offshore financial centers don't necessarily play the same role because ultimately the money, I mean, you can imagine at the highest levels that the money gets paid directly into an offshore account, but often it comes into the country first. So it, the issue doesn't arise in the same way in the typical FCPA case. The payments usually are occurring in the country. Um, but the, the evidence that they get does typically come from the companies, right? As Carlos was pointing out, a big part of the, what makes this system work in the U.S. with a staff of just 45 people or so is that the companies are doing all the investigation through the internal investigations, as I'm sure you know. And to the extent that the companies have a sense of the chain of payments, well, it's relatively straightforward. So that's, those are the two reasons why it's not such an obstacle in the US. First of all, they're not necessarily concerned about that stage of the transaction. And secondly, if the, the, ease, the, the, the task of tracing the financial flows is really um, dealt with by the companies as part of their internal investigations. Um, on the the role of prosecutors. I'm, I'm curious how it will work out in Brazil. I just read the law, right? And I wasn't really reading it because I was sort of extrapolating from the French. And uh, so <laughs> there are limits to that. But um, it's a leniency agreement. That's where the fact that there's the explicit provision for leniency agreements, for the regulators to enter into leniency yeah. agreements yeah. with the companies, that's the part that allows for the possibility of convergence between the Brazilian um, 
model and the, what I'm calling the international model. If, if the legislation had just provided for criminal proceedings or uh, some sort of civil proceedings or even just an administrative proceeding, then I wouldn't be, I would say, yeah, well, it'll, let's wait and see. But the fact that there's this emphasis on agreements and leniency agreements, that's where I suspect there's, that's where I see significant potential for prosecutors or regulators, whoever those bodies are, and I wasn't quite clear on that, but a role for them to really shape the terms of the settlements in much the same way that the Americans and the staff in the World Bank's INT department or the Sears Fraud Office have been doing. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Denis Guimarães. Okay. Professor, in your opinion, uh, does lobby regulation plays an important role in fighting corruption? Or do you would put all, all, uh, all your uh, expectations in exposed uh, devices, such as the, this, this legislation that we are discussing? So lobbying regulation, you said? Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, that depends on your definition of corruption. So if you can include campaign finance of the, in the form that it takes in the United States in your definition of corruption, then yes. Uh, the, and I, I think, generally, I'm sympathetic to this view that any means by which private actors influence public activity is potentially corrupt. You know, you should at least think about whether it's a kind of influence that you as a society want to tolerate. If that's your definition of corruption, any use of private funds to influence official activity, some forms of campaign finance will meet the definition of corruption and so, of course, the regulation that deals with that has to be part of what you consider to be anti-corruption law. So yes, in, in my broader research agenda, I consider all of that. Um, yes, that's the short answer. Yeah.